hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. The United States Declaration of Independence, 1776. Africans reported as slaves and their descendants, slave or free, are not citizens of the United States and can claim none of the rights provided by the Constitution. The United States Supreme Court, 1857. That cracked plate was enough to invoke the wrath of my master, who horse with my poor mother most unmercifully, far more severely than I ever knew him to whip a horse. Austin Stewart, child slave. From 12 years old, when he sees a slave boy his own age beaten with an iron shovel, John Brown will be haunted by the cries of those in bondage. He will spend a lifetime watching his country compromise with the evil of slavery, one unjust law after the next. Salmon Brown, the eighth of John Brown's children, recalls, My early recollections go back clearly to the old home in Hudson, Ohio. Father would sit in front of a lively fire and take up us children, one, two, or three at a time, and sing until bedtime. We all love to hear him sing, as well as to talk of the conditions of the country over which she seemed worried. A favorite song with father and us children was Blow Ye the Trumpet Blow. Blow ye the trumpet blow Throughout the world proclaim that all the nations know be free in Jesus name the year of Jubilee is come the year of Jubilee is come return ye ransom sinners home John Brown's eldest daughter Ruth recalls on fast days and thanksgivings, he used to very often read the 58th chapter of Isaiah. Is not this the fast that I have chosen, saith the Lord, to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that ye break every yoke, 
then shall thy light break forth as the morning. Ye slaves of sin and hell, your liberty receive, ye weary spirits rest, ye mournful souls have November 1837, the Congregational Church, Hudson, Ohio, following a stirring anti-slavery sermon at the shooting death in Illinois of abolitionist publisher Elijah Lovejoy, a 37-year-old John Brown rises to his feet. Here before God, in the presence of these witnesses from this time, I consecrate my life to the destruction of slavery. family to Kansas so he can vote against allowing slavery into the new state. His son Salmon recalls of the journey. Near Independence, Missouri, we saw a slave pen built like a chicken coop, only stronger and higher. Inside the pen was the auction block. This slave selling stirred father to the depths of his soul. virtual civil war exists in Kansas over slavery. A band of 800 men led by a pro-slavery federal marshal sacked the town of Lawrence, burning the governor's mansion, looting homes, and destroying abolitionist printing presses. Three nights later, John Brown and his sons followed the Potawatomi Creek to the cabins of three pro-slavery leaders to retaliate. James Doyle, widow of one of five men murdered on this night by John Brown and his men. This will become known as the Potawatomi Massacre. Autumn, 1859. John Brown has been able to assemble only 21 men willing to join his daring plan to free the slaves. Brown's friend, abolitionist Frederick Douglass, has warned Brown he will never get away from Harper's Ferry alive but John Brown is resolute. 
believing only action, not talk, can put an end to slavery. October 16, 1859, under the cover of darkness, John Brown leads his men into Harper's Ferry. The Federal Arsenal sole watchman is taken by surprise, and John Brown captures 100,000 guns without firing a shot. Brown's men take several hostages, including the great grand nephew of George Washington. Not one of the hostages will be harmed. Brown's second in command urges Brown to flee with the captured weapons and establish a mountain stronghold as planned. But oddly, Brown is reluctant to leave. His hesitation will prove fatal. The Charlestown militia arrives drinking whiskey. Several of Brown's men are killed trying to escape. Their bodies are used for target practice. Brown's son Watson is shot down while under a white flag. <laughs> President James Buchanan dispatches a unit of United States Marines under the command of a colonel by the name of Robert E. Lee. Lee's lieutenant is a 26-year-old West Point graduate known as Jeb Stewart. Lee's forces arrive. The assault is over in less than three minutes. John Brown is wounded by a saber thrust and blow to the head. These are the words John Brown speaks in his defense at the trial. Had I suffered and sacrificed what I have at Harper's Ferry in behalf of the rich, the powerful, the so-called great, every man in his court would have deemed it an act worthy of reward rather than punishment. I see a Bible here that teaches me that I should do unto others as I would have them do unto me, and to remember them that are in bonds as bound with them. I endeavor to act on that instruction in behalf of the millions in this slave country whose rights are disregarded by wicked, cruel, and unjust enactments. I think you are guilty, my friends, of a great wrong against God and humanity. And it would be perfectly right for anyone to interfere with you so far as to free those you willingly and wickedly hold in bondage. You may dispose of me very easily, but this slave question is still to be settled. The end of that is not yet. December 2nd, 1859. John Brown was hung today. with unflinching firmness, 
and ascended the scaffold with apparent cheerfulness. Afterwards, the wind blew his lifeless body to and fro. Thomas Stonewall Jackson, eyewitness. children, when and in what form death may come is but of small moment. I feel just as content to die for God's eternal truth and for suffering humanity on the scaffold as in any other way. Do not any of you grieve for a single moment on my account. As I trust my life has not been thrown away, so I also humbly trust that my death will not be in vain. God can make my death a thousand times more valuable to his own cause than all the service that I have rendered it during my life. Your affectionate husband and father, John Brown.